Hi guys, so this next portion of notes is all about cell division. Uh, we talked last class about how a cell is limited and how large it can get, both by the restraints of its DNA, not being able to keep up with the cell, and that surface area to volume issue. Um, what's cool is that in living organisms, we don't see a cell get too big because the cell sort of realizes that it's starting to get too big and it will divide itself into two of what we call daughter cells via cell division. Now if this happens, then each cell will have a higher surface area to volume ratio, meaning they're going to have lots of surface area compared to just a little bit of volume and that is uh, much more favorable for the cell. A couple things to think about, though, as, as we start talking about cell division. The first question is, you know, what happens if a cell were to arbitrarily, so just randomly, split into two without preparing? That would be bad, right? If that were to happen, then the cell would probably not evenly divide all of its quote-unquote stuff. So some organelles would go to one daughter cell, some organelles would go to the other daughter cell, and most importantly the DNA would probably not divide correctly. You know, you think of it like uh, we were going to open a new branch of a library. That's why I have this cool library picture down here. And let's say we're going to open another branch of a library, and all we're going to do is we're going to take some of the books and leave them in the old library, and take some of the books and put them in the new library. Think about what a pain that would be. Every time you went to try to get a book at the library, they would have to tell you, well, you have to go to the other library across town. That's not fun, right? So what instead we would do is when we open a new library, we get a new copy of all the books so that both libraries will be able to provide for you whatever you need. Cells want to do the same thing. So before they will divide, they will replicate or copy their DNA. So they're going to have two copies of their DNA for just a, a few moments that will then separate evenly into the two daughter cells. So this is maybe the most important preparation step, is to copy the DNA before we make the two new cells. And there's a little bit more about that DNA because we haven't covered that really yet this year. Um, the genetic information that we find in a eukaryotic cell will be found in its nucleus, as we already know, and it's going to be found as these bundles of DNA and protein that we call chromosomes. And here's a picture of, of several chromosomes here. Every organism's cells will contain a different number of chromosomes. So, uh, for instance, like a, a little tiny fruit fly has um, four chromosomes, and that's it. Uh, other organisms might have 12. Other organisms might have 24. Um, when we look at humans, human cells contain 46 chromosomes. So remember that number. That's going to keep coming back over and over again. Um, so you're going to want to know that, that normal human cells have 46 chromosomes. And these actually come in pairs, so a lot of times we say that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes in their cells. Now, in normal conditions, this genetic material is spread out in the nucleus, so even with a microscope we can't really see it. But when a cell starts to get ready for division, the chromosomes will condense down into these rod-like structures that we can actually see with a microscope. Now, as we said a couple slides back, right before cell division, we're going to replicate that DNA or copy that DNA within the nucleus. So, a lot of times we, we have a chromosome and we would draw it kind of like this. And then when it copies itself, we draw it like that, giving us sort of an X-like structure, which might look familiar to you from, from biology classes that you've had in the past. Now, when we look at this sort of structure, each half of it is called a chromatid, or sister chromatid, and then they are attached centrally in the middle here by what's called a centromere. And you see those labeled down in this picture as well. So, so each half of this thing is a chromatid, and then the middle place where the X kind of crosses, so to speak, is your centromere. So, when we talk about cell division, 
we're all probably used to the term mitosis, and we've heard that in, in science classes before. But what we're much more interested in now that you're in high school is what we call the cell cycle. The cell cycle describes the overall life of a cell. And this, it, this means that we're looking at a series of events where the cell grows, the cell gets ready to divide, and the cell actually divides into two new identical cells. And then each of those cells starts the process over again. This is why it's a cycle, because it can keep happening over and over again. Now, the cycle consists of cell division, sometimes referred to as M phase, and then the rest of the time is called interphase. So everything else is interphase. So check out this picture. Um, the actual time within which a cell is dividing is, is just a fraction of the cell's life. In fact, it's um, you know less than a fourth of the time for cells is spent actually dividing. The other, I don't know, more than three-fourths of the time is interphase. Um, so most cells, if we were to just take a sample out of your body and look at it today, are going to be found in interphase and not um, in that actual dividing stage. You may or may not have heard this in the past, um, but interphase, uh, first off, is, is not part of mitosis. So this is a separate thing. And it is itself divided into three different phases. Um, the first phase is called G1 phase. And I like to think of this as the first growth phase. Okay, so G1. This is where the cell is growing. The cell is getting bigger. Um, the cell is making new proteins the cells building organelles. So this is just a nice kind of growing stage for a cell. Now, sometimes a cell will also kick into what is called G0 phase, or sometimes we call this G0. G0 phase is where the cell goes dormant. Um, the cell's still alive, but it's just not actively going through the cycle. This is actually where we find the majority of adult human cells is in G0 phase. They're just sort of asleep, um, so to speak, doing their everyday job, but not trying to divide. Um, and this is very common for most of your cells. Now, if the cell is, I guess we could say, interested in dividing, then after G1 phase, we go to S phase. And S stands for synthesis, DNA synthesis. This is the time when the chromosomes will replicate or copy themselves to go from this kind of thing to this kind of thing. And that's going to allow us to move towards cell division. Now the third stage is called G2, which I like to think of as your second growth phase. This is a shorter period of time, um, and this is where we're making organelles and molecules, but we are, we are totally focused on dividing at this point. Um, and, and we're kind of um, not worried about anything else now. It's just we are getting the cell ready to divide, so we're making sure that it's big enough and has everything that it needs. After we go through those three parts of interphase, and here's another diagram of the cell cycle where again you see how much longer interphase is compared to cell division. But after we've done interphase, then we can go into M phase. Um, and this is where cell division will actually take place. Now we call this M phase because technically two things are going on. The first thing is mitosis, and the second thing is cytokinesis. This should look familiar, I hope. Um, mitosis itself is broken down into four different phases. Uh, that you might recall from a previous class. We've got prophase, we've got metaphase, we've got anaphase, and we've got telophase. Now, the way that I always try to remember these things is PMAT. Right? Those are the, <laughs> that's the order of, of these stages. And so I do expect you to know that, and, and I expect you to know what actually happens in each of these stages as well. So let's move into that. The first stage is prophase. Um, this is the first part of mitosis, this is the longest part of mitosis, 
And as you can see here, this is when the majority of stuff is happening too. Now the nice thing is the other stages are much easier to remember. There's much less going on in each of them. So basically what I recommend is if you can remember what happens in the other stages, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, then just remember that everything else happened back in prophase. So you kind of got two things going on. You've got the nucleus changing and you've got the cytoplasm changing. So we'll start with the nucleus. First thing that happens is the nucleolus disappears. So we don't see that dark spot anymore. Second thing is the chromosomes actually condense, so we get those visible X's. And as you can see in this picture by the dotted line, the nuclear envelope starts to go away. So our nucleus is basically just disappearing. Meanwhile, so at the same time, out in the cytoplasm, these organelles called centrioles will move to opposite ends of the cell, and they will start to form this mitotic spindle. Right? And this is uh, going to be sort of this, this football-shaped lattice inside the cell that the chromosomes can uh, move around on. Each end here, what I've circled in red, is then sometimes called a centrosome. And when we say centrosome, that doesn't mean a particular structure. That just kind of means this area where centrioles are, are doing their thing and, and building the spindle. Now, the last thing to happen in prophase is these chromosomes, which just came out of the nucleus, will attach to the mitotic spindle, um, which is made of proteins called microtubules, and they will attach via their centromere. So basically, if a chromosome is going to attach to this uh, spindle here, it just attaches kind of by that center part of its X. Now, like I said, these other stages are far simpler. Um, second stage of mitosis is metaphase. And metaphase uh, is easy to remember because metaphase, remember, midline. Right, this is only um, a very brief phase where the chromosomes are going to move along the spindle, as you see here in green, um, to line up along the midline of the cell. So, metaphase, chromosomes line up on the midline of the cell. And sometimes we, we call this a metaphase plate when we see the chromosomes lined up in a nice straight line like that. Now, the third stage, or third part of mitosis, is called anaphase, and I remember this one by remembering a part. So we had metaphase midline, anaphase apart, because what happens is the chromosomes will split at their centromere, so split in the middle, and then the sister chromatids will get pulled to opposite ends of the cell, or in other words, they'll get pulled apart, right? Um, what this is going to accomplish is it's going to move half of this duplicated set of DNA to one end and the other half to the other end, leaving us with two sets of DNA that are actually a full set, right? We, we copied or replicated our DNA before we started, so now we're just going to move one copy to each end of the cell. The last part of mitosis is called telophase or telophase. Um, this is where mitosis completes. Uh, basically what happens is we're going to sort of reverse prophase. So as you can see here by the dotted lines, we're going to form a new nuclear envelope around both sets of DNA. We're going to kind of break down the spindle. We're going to bring back nucleoli. Um, and we're going to sort of start this process of separating the cytoplasm. All right, last thing you got to know about cell division is that also part of M phase, we had we had mitosis, right, which is those four steps we just covered, and then there is cytokinesis. Um, after mitosis, the cell has to divide its cytoplasm. And so that's what cytokinesis means. Right, kinesis means to move generally. But, um, but the way that we think of this is that this stands for cell splitting. So we're, we're dividing up the cytoplasm. This happens in two different ways, depending on the kind of eukaryotic cell you are. In animal cells, which is what we see up here on the upper left, 
the cell membrane will literally just sort of pinch or squeeze together at the midline until it pinches the cytoplasm off into two equal parts. Um, this is called a cleavage furrow when we see this um, in cells under the microscope. Uh, um, you don't really have to know that term so much, um, but just know that the cytoplasm will pinch off. In plant cells, it's not so simple because we can't just pinch off at a cell wall. The cell wall resists that. So instead, the uh, plant cells form what's called a cell plate, which is basically like building a new wall in the middle of the cell. So whereas animals just kind of pinch the cell into two, plant cells kind of lay down a new brick wall right down the middle, and once it meets on either end, now you've got two totally different cells. Now, most importantly, and the thing to really take away from all this, is the results of mitosis. Okay, so mitosis and cytokinesis is going to result in two new cells, each of those identical to each other and to the parent in terms of their genes, okay, or their DNA. So mitosis is going to finish with two cells that are identical to each other and identical to the parent cell that they came from. All right, that's all I've got. Um, thank you for uh, listening to this. I hope you have or, or had a great Thanksgiving, and I will see you guys in class uh, next time when we start talking about how we're going to control or regulate this whole cell division process.